Hey everyone, Ben Cooper Radio, episode number 178, I think. I know I get this wrong all the time. Don't worry about it. It's a minor, minor detail. I've never been good with numbers. It's not a strength of mine. I like talking about nutrition, training, and mindset. I'll stick to that, um, and hopefully I'll get numbers right uh, some of the time. So we haven't um, kind of breached the kind of true dynamics of uh, hypertrophy since we spoke to Eric Helms. We kind of delved into that area a little bit. Um, I hope you all enjoyed the show with Eric. Um, we're going to delve even more into this from a very scientific perspective today because ultimately we know an awful lot about the science of hypertrophy. It's something that can be quite easily measured once the variables are got right in the right environment. Um, and there's no one really better to speak to than Brad Schoenfeld. Brad, hello. How are you doing, Brad? Great to be here. Mate, um, there's going to be tons of people that know who you are. We have a huge section of the fitness community that listen to this show. For that other bit that have no idea who you are, give me a little background on who you are, what you do, and what the journey was to get you so excited and work in the field of uh, muscular hypertrophy. Sure. I, I got into the field basically because I was a skinny kid who was very unhappy with uh, the way I looked, my physique at, at the time, and uh, found resistance training. It uh, was a fish and water type of uh, deal where I just adapted to it very quickly. And from there I decided, uh, along with other people asking me, they saw the results I was getting, asked me to help them, and just really found a niche in terms of working with, uh, with people uh, to get them there their physique and, and to improve their own self-esteem. I ended up turning that into partly that into a fitness facility where I was a one-on-one. -on -one. I trained one-on-one. -on -one. I had other trainers working for me. So it was kind of a journey in that respect, but I ultimately got bit by the uh, educational bug and I went back, got my master's degree and subsequently my PhD, wanted to teach and research. And for the past uh, five years now, that's pretty much been what I'm, uh, what I'm doing. I sold my training facility back in 2011 so now, almost five years ago, uh, once I really devoted full time to teaching, and at this point, I uh, I'm a educator. I lecture around the world. I write books. I write a column for Muscular Development magazine. I do research. Carried a lot of research studies in my lab. I'm he head of the Human Performance Lab at my college, which is Lehman College in the Bronx, New York, and just have a real passion for uh, educating and, and informing on on the science and practice because. One thing I want to say at the outset is that exercise is both is, is a science, but it's an applied science. So I, it's important to understand that we can draw, that science should form the underlying basis of our decision making, but there's a lot of applied aspects that must be gleaned from our own practical experience, as well as individualizing it to the, to the particular person who's looking to get jacked. Sure. So, I mean... The kind of applied terminology is great, and I think there's probably a fine line between applied and opinion, because a lot of people, a lot of stuff is materialised in the exercise world around opinion. I'm sure you can think about many practitioners that have become popular based on opinion, and really, when you look at it, it's not really based on any kind of sound methodology, and that's kind of where we need to, I suppose kind of bridge that gap. Um, your research is obviously heavily focused on hypertrophy. Now, there's some key principles that we know of hypertrophy that I think seem to get overlooked in the health and fitness world. Like, we, we kind of go towards something that's a bit more sexy rather than lean back and go, hang on, let's, let's look at the basics first because the basics are, are often unsexy. People don't want to know it. It's like, it's like supplements in the nutrition world. Get your diet sorted first, and then we'll look at supplements, for example. Um, are there principles of hypertrophy that you feel in the industry right now or in the past has been overlooked um, by kind of theories and opinion that are not really proven or are less important? Well, I'll start by saying that resist that when you resist and strain, you can get bigger, and you will. From basically, it's Getting bigger just uh, involves one or two basic things, training hard and resting properly. Uh, and you can do it with a limited amount of volume. So just a modicum, you, you can get results from almost any program. And, and as long as you apply some progressive overload where you're training hard, pushing your body, and then having rest, so sufficient rest to allow yourself to recuperate. Within that, now my, my goal in, 
and my research focus is to maximize hypertrophy. And that's where the line gets blurred. So you kind of want to just go back. You would talk about opinion. Opinion, everyone has an opinion or can have an opinion. But if it's not based on underlying science, then the, the veracity of that opinion is compromised. And, and that's what I wanted to point out, where it's really important to have a fundamental understanding of what science teaches us, because that's where you can control everything. You, just to say it worked for me, well, you might have better genetics, you might be on gear, there's all sorts of things that can make it work for you. And just because something works doesn't mean something else wouldn't work better. So with, with that said, there are some basic tenets that some people do overlook. Uh, the first is the dose-response relationship of hypertrophy with volume. And uh, it's very clear from the literature that there is a, uh, there's a response. Uh, the more you train, so the more volume you have, the greater the results are going to be in your hyper hypertrophic response up to a given point. So it's not that, yeah, you could train three hours a day and just pack huge amounts of volume in and do it every day. That doesn't mean that will be necessarily better than a lesser volume. Uh, where that sweet spot is, is not known, certainly through the literature, I can't tell you. And, and it's highly individual. You can't give a cookie cutter response to that because if you actually look at a curve, when you would take different people through different volume responses, you'd see very different results. So the, the point that I'm making here is that you, you can achieve greater hypertrophy from greater volume, but that's going to be somewhat individual. I can't give you and say 10 sets a week for each muscle group or for a large muscle group and for a small six sets. You can give general guidelines to that, but ultimately it's up to the person to play around with these different um, variations and find out what that sweet spot is. That's number one. Number two, I said training hard is really important, but training hard all the time is destined to lead to overtraining if you keep doing it. So generally speaking, the, the, there is good, in my opinion, good evidence that you need to have periods of deloading where you're not training as hard. So training balls to the wall every time you're working out is going to ultimately have a negative effect if you're doing it too often. And this is where, again, the art of training comes in. And uh, so much of what my research focus is, is in trying to find out these sweet spots and to provide general recommendations towards them. Okay. So this is obviously the tough bit. And I'm wondering if you have any kind of guidelines on this. Take me, for example, been training 10 years, probably five of them very averagely, five of them a bit better, the last one or two you know, pretty decent. I've understood a lot more about my body training, uh, overload progression. I'm obviously in a place where I'm always thinking, okay, how much volume is appropriate for me? How much can I get in? How hard can I work? For people, we'll call them semi, semi experienced to advanced lifters. Do you have any idea other than actually you kind of need to work with a coach and really feel your way through this of trying to find that almost volume sweet spot for that person. Uh, so you were kind of cutting out of me there, but you're talking about from a volume perspective? Yeah. How, is there a way to start to identify where that sweet spot is for more intermediate advanced okay. lifters? So um, I've recently been involved in a meta analysis, which is a pooling of all the literature. And uh, there is, based on the evidence, there is good evidence that more than 10, I would say a good starting point would be more than 10 sets per week per muscle group. Um, so training each muscle group more than 10 sets per week. Now, logically, the larger muscle groups would probably need some more volume than that and perhaps somewhat less with the smaller muscle groups just because of the amount of muscle involved. That is really not well borne out by the literature, but in the absence of, of evidence, you try to use logic to start determining these things. Um, how much more? Well, part of that is going to depend, on, again, on individual recovery, uh, genetic factors, lifestyle factors, individual stresses that you might be going through, because other life stressors can interfere with, with your recuperative abilities uh, conceivably. So to try to pin it down further than that is somewhat difficult, but I would say that as you get more advanced, or at least as the, the prospect, I would start with somewhat higher volumes, let's say 12 plus sets per week per muscle group and perhaps go from there. Now, now one thing that I do want to also mention, and when you talk about kind of tenets that have been 
given down from the gods as if they were the Ten Commandments and gospel. One of them is this hyper, the concept of a hypertrophy loading zone. So using that 8 to 12 reps is optimal for hypertrophy. And while there is nothing inherently wrong with that, with doing that, with training in that range, there is a, uh, some, there, first of all, there is compelling evidence that you can get hypertrophy throughout a spectrum of loading ranges from very low repetitions, from one to five repetitions, to 20 plus, 20 to 30 plus repetitions can promote substantial hypertrophy. And some recent work from my lab and others uh, does suggest there might be benefits to combining different loading strategies. So having periods of lower repetition training, one to five reps, moderate rep training, your eight to 12 hypertrophy, and your 20 plus, 15 to 20 plus rep training as well, and combining them in, there's many different ways you can combine them, but whether it's daily undulating periodization, weekly undulating, linear type periodization, even within uh, sessions, having some higher and lower loading zones, that that can actually help to maximize hypertrophy through targeting different fiber types. And there's some, again, good, good evidence that, uh, or at least emerging evidence that that may be the case. So based on kind of what you've just said, and linking it back to the traditional bodybuilding approach that we're still reading in magazines and have done for years. If we took a shoulder training session, for example, and we did uh, dumbbell press, military press, lateral raises, a few other raises, and we're hitting 12, you know, 15 sets from three to five different exercises, we're, in terms of the research, we're, we're pretty close to being that being a perfect training program for, you know, for a body part, for example. Yeah, so certainly that would be the case. Now, what I will say, too, um, the bro-type split where you're doing that all, let's say, one day a week uh, can certainly work. And I have a study that was done where we had a similar type protocol. But there is some evidence that greater frequency also may help to spread, when I say greater frequency, spreading out that training load. So using the same exact volume but spreading it out over more days at least two maybe even three days a week may have better results than just doing it one although I will say that the evidence is still emerging on this and that it doesn't mean that you can't have bro types what's included in your routine but structuring your routine in some way where at some point over the course of a training cycle you have greater frequencies uh, rotated into that program that it might help to optimize the hypertrophic response. Okay, nice. Yeah, we talk a lot. We talked a lot about that with Eric and and Lane previously. So, yeah, brilliant. Um, do you think the kind of hypertrophy landscape and us always looking to evolve an answer when we boil it down to the general consumer, uh, to personal trainers and coaches as well? Do you think a lot of this, and we could probably say the same with fat loss? There's a massive component of patience, that people maybe aren't prepared to be as patient as they should be because we know that fat loss could be a slow process, we know that muscle building could be a slow process, and actually trying to maybe overanalyze the dynamics of hypertrophy, perhaps we just need a spoonful of patience to, and to say, look, if you're an advanced lifter, you're probably only going to gain a couple of pounds over the course of a year, and if you're doing that, then realistically, just keep doing that and by all means be aware of the emerging science but the chances are nothing's really going to radicalize itself from that. Yeah, so I would say that as you start getting closer to what would be called your genetic ceiling, so when you start to train, you become more and more well trained, you're going to get higher to your genetic potential, they call that the genetic ceiling, and thus the rate of gains are going to slow down substantially. Now. I would argue that you need to start being more and more scientific to eke out those extras. As you said, a couple pounds a year, two, three, four pounds a year would be a, a very nice gain over the course of time for someone with five, let's say five plus years training experience. Now, taking a more scientific approach, it doesn't mean that you'll get nothing by, you, you might get nothing by not taking the scientific approach, but it's really eking out maybe an extra pound of muscle. So you, instead of getting two pounds, you might be able to get three pounds. Now, is that practically meaningful? Well, to that, I can't tell you whether that's practically meaningful. To someone who wants to compete or, or where every last ounce of muscle matters, then that is practically meaningful. 
to others it might not be and uh, that's only something that someone uh, who oh, you can only do that uh, take sense of that on an individual basis but I will say that I'm highly confident and I've worked with a lot of people who have stagnated who've reached plateaus and have been able to eke out certainly more gains where they weren't getting them before through having a more scientifically based approach to training of course of course okay interesting um so with hypertrophy, uh, I've read that you are a fan of varying your exercise selection. Um, what would you recommend for someone that trains in a facility with limited equipment? Like I've got a home gym, I've only got a couple of bits of kit. Um, maybe someone trains in a CrossFit box or a small studio. How would you, let's say this guy has three to five years training experience. How would you look to create variety with limited equipment? Well, there's so certainly I, I am a big fan of uh, variety, as you point out, that muscles have varied attachments and that by working them from uh, different angles. Is that vodka, by the way? Uh, gin. <laughs> Good for you, man. <laughs> um, so by training muscles from different angles, you will maximize the symmetry uh, between muscles. That, uh, And this has been borne out not only through logic, but in terms of research, where it's shown that uh, there was a recent study uh, by a group in Brazil that just did squats uh, in one group and then varied it between squats and leg presses and lunges and deadlifts in another and showed more complete hypertrophy of the quads uh, through the varied training approach. And this really is specific to most of the muscles in the body. Now, yeah, when you have limited equipment, you're going to have, it's going to be harder for you, but certainly it doesn't preclude you from doing it. So you can get huge um, variations just by having a bench and dumbbells and some resistance bands and, uh, and some other basic equipment and just some knowledge of training that will allow you to train different angles. So for instance, a shoulder, let's, let's take a chest press, number one, or a chest, chest workout with a bench and, uh, and some dumbbells. You can work the you can work a flat press, uh, you can work a incline fly, let's say, and you can do a, just adding some band work in, you can get a, a different um, angle to that and, and work either the upper or lower portions of the chest in a, in a different plane. With shoulders, you can, just a set of dumbbells, you can do shoulder presses, you can do lateral raises, you can do bent laterals, again, hitting the muscle from varied angles. Um, squats, lunges, uh, all can be done with free weight. So, so a lot of variation can be done through, um, through with limited equipment. And I will say that having more equipment does give you more options. It's like a painter that's painting with a few colors as opposed to having a palette of colors. It, it improves the options for the painter and potentially he can have a, a better painting or, or more uh, evocative and complete painting, but it doesn't mean that you can't have a terrific painting with with limited colors. Do you think this kind of almost links back to my point about patience in that sometimes we almost look for an excessive of variety because most training programs are going to revolve around like a squat is always really going to be in a training program, a deadlift, you know, a big press exercise. And then there's only really going to be two, maybe three accessory exercises. And once you've been through, let's say, a six week block of training, you might then look to change it then change it again, and then you might revert back to the first block and the first set of exercise you had. And really, the chances are you can just tweak the hand position, like you say, put a band on, put a chain on. So probably you've got years and years of training before you do actually have to like, really think laterally, potentially about it. Yeah, and I would definitely concur that generally I like to have a core group of exercises that serve as fundamental movements. Usually those are going to be your multi-joint uh, compound movements, exercises like squats and, and rows and uh, presses. So certain movements will be staples within the, the routine and then you're going to have some variety within some of the accessory movements. Uh, so now the more complex the movement is, the more you want to tend to keep that in your routine because once you stop doing it for periods of time, it gets the, there's a reacclimation phase, neural programming to get back the feel to the movement. Whereas the more simple movements, if you will, don't require as much, nearly as much remoto learning once you leave them out, and thus you can factor them in over time to a greater degree. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna tie in two two questions here. Um, it's someone that uh, 
is, is very close uh, to me in terms of our, our company, Tom Brainbridge. He's a massive fan of your work. He'd also like to invite you around for dinner uh, when you're next in Newcastle. <laughs> um, he was talking about the recent research that you're trying to do in the mind-muscle connection, uh, which I believe is something is ongoing. No, well, no. Um, so I actually just published a so this month's edition of the uh, NSCA Strength and Conditioning Journal a review paper on the topic where we really hypothesized based on the literature that there would be a benefit to having a mind-to-muscle connection. I do have a study, a longitudinal study, that will look to test that hypothesis because it really hasn't. What we know at this point is that muscle activation can be improved through a, a mind-to-muscle connection, meaning that if you think about a given muscle and try to focus on that, you can exert more activation to that muscle as measured by EMG. And there is evidence that where the activation occurs does uh, improve the muscular response, that you get greater adaptations in the area of activation. However, no one has actually studied whether the mind-to-muscle connection directly leads to greater muscle growth than a non than a um, strategy where you don't focus on the muscle. So that will be taking place. I actually have that as a, um, it's uh, in process at this point, and I plan to start data collection this summer, or later this summer on that. Interesting. And I suppose quantifying that, I'm intrigued a little bit by what your method might be in quantifying bit, because it's like, how do we say, it's almost like, how much power is he sending to the muscle from his mind almost? Um, can you, is there a little bit of insight that you could give me there? Yeah, so um, not to give too much away before the study is, is taken, but uh, the first thing we do is to quantify the EMG that the subjects are actually creating greater. EMG measures the electrical activity in a muscle, and uh, you can get a sense as to whether there is more force being exerted through that muscle, uh, at least from an activation standpoint, as opposed to other muscles. So the first thing we would do is to look at the um, whether they're able to activate the muscle selectively or to a greater degree and, and target that muscle to a greater degree. And then the next step would be, and is going to be, to actually measure the growth when you put this technique to, to the test. Interesting. Um, so how I was going to try and link that I have been doing a lot of uh, re, I'd say rewiring of my biomechanics over the last four or five months. Been working with a good S and C coach, and he's been picking apart my tight and weak points and all the rest of it. And you often hear online, especially when you engage in conversations, that squ- people don't feel that squats are a good muscle builder for them, or that deadlifts aren't a big muscle builder, or maybe the bench press, and. I'm wondering what your advice is when people say that, because we can talk about loading, we can talk about progression, all that kind of stuff. But for me, in my recent evolution with my training, there's such a huge component of the ability to contract a muscle. So I've spent a huge amount of my lifting career doing the deadlift with my back and doing the squat half with my back as well. Like If you looked at my old squat pattern, you know I'm, I'm doing half the exercise at the top of my back and stuff, and now I'm actually legitimately... You know, getting my pelvis in the right place, my glutes can activate properly. I can actually fire my hamstrings out of the hole, like all these different things. And I'm I'm squatting now with like half the weight I was, and I feel like I'm legitimately building my legs and actually have a legitimate leg pump when I train, purely because I've just enabled the muscle to activate. So especially in these online conversations, what tends to be you know, do you ever breach that topic of actually it might be your biomechanics that is screwed up? Yeah, and that's a great point. I was uh, speaking with Dave Tate, my colleague of mine, Dave Tate. Who you might know he's a champion powerlifter, yep. just an incredible powerlifter. And, um, he uh, now is training more for bodybuilding style training, and his really a very telling thing he said to me was, I never really started to grow until I was actually able to, until I ditched the powerlifting philosophy mindset of just getting that weight up and really focus on making the muscle work. And uh, I completely concur that certainly you can get larger from a external focus where you're not thinking about the muscle and just driving it up. To me, as you start to get more advanced and the growth gets harder, as we talked about getting towards that genetic ceiling, that you that having concepts like these make more and more uh, become of more and more importance. 
to growth. And that, yeah, focusing less on just driving that weight up and, and focusing more on making the proper muscles do the work, uh, in my humble opinion, is of great, greater importance as you become more and more well-trained to, to eke out that extra growth. And, and when this occurs, what kind of practitioners do you tend to refer people to, like good s and coach, an osteopath, a physio? What tends to be your go-to sort of modality of thinking to correct this? Well, I mean, to me, it's the training that a person has is somewhat secondary to their knowledge and approach. So you can have, you can be trained in one thing, but also have just good intuition and, and be well-read in, in other areas. So I've seen very good coaches that have that come from a wide array of disciplines. Uh, so when referring someone out, uh, by the way, Eric Kelms to me is one of the, the top guys in terms of really having a good understanding of these types of, of nuances. Um, but, you know, I'll, I'll work with someone directly. Now, there are certain muscles that become much more difficult for some people to connect with than others, and certain exercises themselves, as you, I think, kind of alluded to, that are more difficult than others for people to connect with. Single joint movements tend to be a lot easier. So a leg extension, you're going to be able to focus on your quads more, as a general rule, than you are during a squat. But uh, I think with most of the people I've worked with, uh, if with due diligence, you can certainly improve that in virtually any type of movement and, and get people to have greater, connect to a much greater degree with their muscles if they have the right mindset towards, towards accomplishing that. Okay, cool. Um, coming back to resistance bands, because you, you briefly mentioned it, um, they've kind of taken a bit of a rise in recent years, people posting on online that they're doing a bench now with bands or chains and stuff. Um, surely this is another good modality for people that have low use of equipment, like me in my home gym, for example. And as a whole, do you think bands and chains are good for overload in certain kind of sort of strength curves or ranges? Yeah, I'm a big fan of accommodating resistance. Um, I, I like to use Bands in particular, I like to use on machines, like a, I'm a big fan of hammer strength machines, I like the feel of the machines, I like their, uh, the fact that they allow for unilateral movement, uh, and when you attach bands, uh, most of them are, are designed so that you can attach bands to them, you improve the strength curve. So bands make it harder in the end range of the movement, and obviously don't have as much of an effect in the earlier range of movement. And by you utilizing them, you even out that strength curve, and it basically they are synergistic with a lot of the uh, equipment, and as well as with free weights. So yeah, I, I'm a big fan of that, and, uh, and certainly for more advanced lifters, I, I don't use them much in the beginning stages of training, uh, but you start to integrate them in the immediate, intermediate stages, and certainly with advanced uh, clients, uh, individuals, they they have the I think a very good place. Mm, definitely, I think there's, I mean. If I, I've done it. I'm a big fan of getting uh, resistant bands between two dumbbells and doing a flat bench fly. But even getting into that position, if you're not an experienced lifter, you don't have good coordination of the shoulder joint, activation of the pec. You know your lats and subscapular muscles can't stabilise. So you know you're not going to do that exercise efficiently, regardless of how good it looks on a Facebook video. That and uh, you also increase the chance of injury because of the uh, discoordination, if that's the word. Uh, that is uh, basically they alter the, the movement pattern. So uh, especially when you're having more degrees of freedom as in a dumbbell or barbell, uh, it's, it's more applicable to machines for less experienced uh, individuals. But when you get more experience, yeah, the free weight, uh, in, uh, implementing them in free weights becomes much harder and I think it's specifically relegated to more advanced trainees. Sure. Okay, cool. Um... Now, I think you you are well within the kind of bodybuilding powerlifting world, and this kind of transfers very much to the contest prep world. We've already mentioned Eric Helms, Lane Norton, people that you would have spoke to on various occasions, which are well embedded in the contest prep world, as is kind of your theories. Um, now, jumping on stage, very popular area of the fitness industry, loads of people are doing it, huge in the UK, huge in America. Um, do you have any particular advice or methods for people training when going through their diet process? Because I see an awful lot of people, you know, you get to this, right, it's 16 weeks time and 
everything gets thrown at the situation and people very quickly become burnt out. You talk about, you know, uh, deloads, um, that kind of stuff. To me, it doesn't seem like people are very intelligently in the mainstream, you know, let me add, um, kind of programming all this stuff. So what if you've got kind of a generalist advice to say, look, if you are doing this, bear in mind these considerations with your training and I bet you, you'll have an easier path to getting on stage successfully. Yeah, so one of the big things is not to uh, lose weight too rapidly, so to make sure that you're dialing it in so that you're not forced to lose weight, you know, try to lose four pounds a week, uh, which would require just drastic cuts in, in calories and energy status, and that would have a drastic effect on your ability to train. So if you're looking to, um, it, basically you want to start coming into a competition where you're only going to need to lose a pound a week or so, to nail it in by the time of your competition, and that way you can sustain energy levels, not be on as great a deficit. Uh, that's number one. Number two, from a nutritional standpoint, is to keep, and, and this generally is not an issue for most bodybuilding, uh, physique-oriented uh, people, but keeping protein intake high. Sure. That the uh, when you start getting lower with your calories, that you will buffer any losses of muscle, which are going to happen depending upon how quickly you're losing the, it happens worse if you're losing more quickly. Uh, but regardless, you're going to lose at least some degree of muscle as you start getting into very low body fat levels. It's just extremely hard to, to maintain muscle um, those last weeks. But I, I will say from a training standpoint, I do recommend, uh, and this is really what, why it is somewhat tricky, I, I like to have a somewhat of a shock phase at the end to try to maximize muscular response and that can help to preserve and I've even in with sophisticated measures seen some minimal increases in muscle towards the last week when you pro provide a shock phase to the um, to the muscle accretion process and that's where you're going to increase the training frequency and, and the intensity of the training now I don't generally recommend going very high volumes within sessions so basically volume is increased through more frequent training but thus there is less recuperation between training sessions and that's why again having very low energy status as would be needed if you have a lot of weight to lose is a detriment so I do recommend that you increase training frequency towards that last cycle over the last let's say three weeks of training going towards a five six day a week type of program where you're really uh, hitting the muscles more frequently and with greater because volume does have this effect basically it's it's shocking your body if you will uh, into into growth it's providing it with a novel stimulus that it hasn't seen and if you do it properly you kind of walk that fine edge between over a non-functional overreaching and functional overreaching so functional overreaching is where you get a super compensatory response non-functional overreaching is where that response is going to not only trail off but perhaps have a negative effect due to negative effects on the immune system and other factors so uh, Kind of that's it in a nutshell and in the simplistic terms without there's just so many factors that you start to look at at that uh, end stage. Those are kind of the biggies. Sure. So for a lot of people listening, it's it's very much a fact. Let's say you were training one body part per, per week and you did uh, six exercises, for example. Ideally, you'd, you'd want to cut that in half, train that at two different points in the week, but keep volume the same. But the increased frequency is going to help preserve muscle tissue rather than increase frequency and increase volume. No, no, no. I would so basically, let's say, well, it would depend on, on how many days a week you're training. So let's say you have a four-day split. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that would depend upon what your current training uh, protocol is. But if you let's say you have a, a, a four-day routine where you're doing an upper and lower split, basically by spreading it out over six days, you would be increasing the volume because you, let's say you're having an hour session four days a week, by having an hour session six days a week, or hour and a half, whatever it is, keeping the session length the same, but spreading it out now over six days a week uh, would enhance the response. Now, if someone's already training six days a week, I would say they shouldn't be doing that year round. Uh, that if they're doing, let's say, one body part a day, six days a week, that would not be my, I, I would not think, uh, and, and based on the evidence, that that's an effective year round type strategy. I think it would be better to have greater frequency and, and periodize that so that you're working the muscles more frequently throughout the week over the course of a training cycle. Got you. Okay, cool. Fascinating. 
Um, you are going to have piqued the interest of a lot of people today. Uh, you've talked uh, about some brilliant stuff when it comes to hypertrophy. I believe you have a book coming out soon. Um, I think you said pre-orders are available on Amazon already. What What's the book called so they can type it into the old Amazon monster and maybe grab a copy for themselves? Yeah, so it's a textbook. It's uh, for more advanced. So it's going to require that you have some fundamental knowledge of exercise science, but for those who really want to get into the science uh, of the training, it's called The Science and Development of Muscle Hypertrophy, published by Human Kinetics. It's coming out in July, but available for pre-order now. It's available in the UK, on UK Amazon, certainly in the US on Amazon, and throughout the world, and um, has almost a thousand peer-reviewed references. It's a, a really detailed book that takes you everything from a molecular level to the variables, uh, everything from volume to frequency to uh, rest intervals and beyond, gets into the nitty-gritty of that, talks about different periodization schemes and how they can be applied uh, for maximal for maximal muscular response, gets into the nutritional end, the science of the nutrition behind maximizing muscle growth. So uh, very detailed, uh, very applied. So it has a lot of the science, the basic science, but also gets into a lot of the application as to how to nail in your variables, how to design the program around it, and how to maximize your nutritional response. So, yep, available on Amazon. And people can also check me out. I have a uh, very active website uh, on lookgreatnaked.com. And it's look great naked, not look good naked. Apparently, look good naked is a porn site, so <laughs> but at your own peril, but look great naked. I do have a blog and post on that, and also uh, feel free to to uh, send me a friend request or uh, follow me on social media. I'm on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. So Okay, amazing. Uh, on Facebook and Twitter and stuff, are you just down as Brad Schoenfeld? Correct. Correct, awesome. So yeah, every- they can just search and, and they'll get me. I think on Twitter, it's... Um, Brad Dot Schoenfeld, if I recall, on Instagram it's Brad Schoenfeld PhD, and on uh, Facebook, if you just search on, on any of those social media, you'll get me. Nice. Well, you've heard it, people. Uh, follow the man on social media. Um, if you enjoyed today's show, it's always good to chat with us. Like, tag us both in on Twitter. Tell us what you think of the show. Tell us about your experiences with training. I've, I've mentioned a couple of things with my training today. You know, talk to us about yours, maybe ask Brad a question. This is the whole idea of a podcast. It's to stimulate conversation. It's to stimulate greater growth and learning so we develop as individuals and practitioners. Um, Brad, thank you very much for giving up your time and being on the show. It's been fantastic. Oh, my pleasure, Ben. Anytime. For everyone that's listening, uh, I will be with you next week. I'll be back on with Rachel with our usual Q&A show, and then we'll have a guest the week after that. Uh, In the meantime, uh, stay awesome, keep developing, keep learning, and go and check Brad out on social media. That's goodbye from me. See you all next week. Recovery Radio, episode number 177. I sit here bright eyed, bushy tailed with my ever present, ever wonderful guest, uh, sorry, co host, uh, Rachel Guy. Hello.